Hello. Welcome, everybody, to our session this morning with the fabulous John Woods. This session is coming live to you, wherever you might be, as part of the Bayside Seniors Festival for October 2020. So before we begin, I'd like to acknowledge the traditional custodians of the land in which we join today. For me, that is the Buddharong people of the Kulin Nation. And I pay my respects to their elders, past, present and emerging. My name is Paula Clancy, Council's Community Resilient and Safety Coordinator. And we're very pleased to be having a coffee with John Woods with us this morning. So John is a Gold Logie award-winning Australian actor and screenwriter, and also best known for his roles uh, as magistrate Michael Rafferty in the legal drama Rafferty Rules, and also as Senior Sergeant Tom Croydon in the long-running police drama Blue Healers. <clears throat> and also more recently, John has written his own book, and that book is called How I Clawed My Way to the Middle, which John will talk a little bit more about as well. So John has kindly actually um, provided um, some of his books to be able to give away today to you in the audience, which is exciting. So we'll have some questions that we'll pose in the end there um, <clears throat> to give those books away to you as well. So as John, John will have a chat to us about 20 minutes or so. And over that time, please pop your questions into the Q&A function. So when we finish there, we can jump into and start having some wonderful conversations um, with you in the audience. So just to let you know, this session will also be recorded for those that just couldn't make it this morning. So we can have that, make that available to them. So sit back and have your cup of tea or coffee and please join me in welcoming John Wood. Good morning. I think I'm on. <laughs> um, thank you very much. It's uh, very nice to be here. I, I am uh, coming. I'm coming to you at Bayside from the Yarra Valley, which is quite a way away, um, beyond the 25k limit that we have set upon us in Victoria at the moment. But uh, it's very nice to be with you and. Uh, I hope you enjoy yourselves this morning. Um, I've even got a coffee with a in a cup given to me by my granddaughter. Um, I've been asked to talk uh, about my life a bit, um, <laughs> which is now seventy four years and counting, and uh, I, I don't know how I'm quite going to do that in twenty minutes, but. Um, uh, and normally when I have a coffee with someone, I, I, I mostly do the listening. But uh, anyway, I'll uh, talk a bit about what is in the book, um, which is the story of my life. Not, not so much in art. I, I'm not convinced that uh, acting is an art. I, I've always believed it to be more of a craft than an art. Um, I think writing for the theatre is, is an art, but uh, actually acting on stage is more of a craft and, uh, and anybody can do it, you know, like, uh, and everybody thinks they can do it, but it's, uh, it's not as easy as it looks. And, and, uh, and it's very, I feel very blessed to have been uh, given the skills to, to do what I do, which is, uh, you know, it's, it's sort of a bit like being a painter or a sculptor, which <laughs> of course, you know, says uh, art, but uh, it's, uh, as I said, I'm not convinced that it is an art. Um, I've been very interested to, to speak to a few people who've read the book. Um, and it would seem that my life is not at all unique um, to anybody who grew up in Melbourne in the 50s and early 60s, um, they all, you know, apparently had virtually exactly the same sort of childhood as I did. Uh, there's nothing 
unique or particularly interesting about my childhood, although I do go into a, a fair bit of detail in the book. Um, partly because as I was writing, and it's something that I never ever intended to do was to write an autobiography or in my case, more of a memoir. Um, it's, it's not something that I felt, you know, the, the book, as Paula said, is called How I Clawed My Way to the Middle, which everybody says, oh my gosh, you're so self-effacing. And, uh, and it's, that's not exactly true. I mean, I, 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 um, I, I used the title because I thought it was very funny, um, and it was it was once said to me by a very close mate of mine in the in the theatre business, uh, a guy named Ron Challoner said to me, uh, "That's what the title of his autobiography would be: How I Clawed My Way to the Middle." And I thought that's very funny and 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 also very ironic i suppose but it also in many ways sums up the way i feel about my career um i don't know i don't know how one gets to what is perceived as the top in in australia uh, i think i think we're very well, I, I don't, I, you know, I think the middle's about where I ended up. Um, if I'd wanted to go further, or if I could have gone further, I suppose I would have gone to London or Hollywood, and uh, um, you know, and, and followed in the footsteps of Jeffrey Rush and Kate Blanchett and people like that. But it's it's not something I ever wanted to do. I, you know, from the moment I became an actor, I always felt. Uh, you know, like uh, I, I became an actor in 1970. I became a professional actor. I'd been doing it for most of my teens as an amateur, and I went to NIDA, and uh, I was very lucky to get in because uh, I I didn't have a leaving certificate, which was the the first prerequisite that one had to have to get into the National Institute of Dramatic Art. And I see they call it art, but uh, <laughs> I think it should have been called the National Institute of Dramatic Craft. Anyway, I, I didn't get my leaving for various reasons, which uh, explained in the book. Um, and I, I haven't told you anything about my childhood, which, you know, like I only got interested in my childhood because I realised as I was writing how much I, I owed to my parents and how much I missed them being around. Uh, they've both been dead for many years now and uh, I, I realised how much I missed them and how much, you know, like I would have loved to have shared the success I had on Blue Healers with them and, uh, you know, and couldn't. Um, Mum was still alive when Blue Healers started, but um, Dad had died. He did He did actually see Rafferty's rules and uh, despite his premonitions of, uh, and his uh, comment when I was a kid of, uh, I don't know what you want to do that bloody acting for. It's bloody sissy sport. And I think uh, he changed his view of it as my life in the theatre went on. And uh, I think he was pretty chuffed with the success of Rafferty's Rules. And, uh, and as I said, it's a pity they didn't get to see the huge success of Blue Healers, which, um, you know... Would have to uh, would have to rate as one of the most successful shows ever on Australian TV, um, due in no small part to one of your local citizens, Lisa McCune, who lives at Sandringham somewhere. Um, Lisa is uh, one of the best actors I've ever come across, and uh, and uh, one of the most skilled and beautiful and. Uh, and exceedingly popular, you know, she was, and she was wonderful in Blue Healers, absolutely wonderful. And uh, funnily enough, she's the, virtually the same age as my eldest daughter. And uh, it was, 
it, it was a very familial relationship that we had on the show, I think. Um, and it was very much like being, uh, being with my daughter when, when I was around Lisa. And of course, some of the other kids when they came on the show, Damien and Jane Allsop and Tasma Walton, uh, you know, they were all the age of my children or slightly younger. And uh, as I said, it was a very familial relationship, very paternal, I think, without being paternalistic. Um, anyway, uh, so the, the childhood, I grew up in Croydon, which is just about 20 k's to my right. Um, and it's it was in those days when I when I moved to Croydon. I was born in Port Melbourne. Um, my father had been a prisoner of war, and uh, he uh, he was captured in Greece and spent three years in German prison camps until the end of the the, the war in Europe, and then came home and fairly quickly married mum and uh, and in fairly short order I was born in 1946 so I'm uh, you know right in the heart of the well, probably at the forefront of the the baby boomer generation um, um, which I'm constantly reminded I should be ashamed of because we had it so easy which I I personally don't think is the case. I don't think it's true that our generation had anything particularly easy. Um, sure, by the time we got to university age, uh, university was free or free-ish. Uh, nothing's, nothing's ever free. But I think um, the benefits that uh, we received as members of the baby boomer generation were well and truly deserved by our parents' generation who'd lived through the First World War and the Depression and the Second World War and were struggling on fairly mediocre wages to uh, bring up families. And I think the benefits, whatever benefits they were given, they well and truly deserved. And we just happened to be the babies of those people who got those benefits, and uh, and so we, of course, benefited as, as well. But it's it's not as if we did any better than uh, subsequent generations. And I get a bit tired of being referred to as um, some ultra fortunate individual as a, a member of, of, of our generation. But anyway, I, I think, as I said, my childhood was not in any way unique. Uh, it was anybody that's my age watching this or joining this conversation, uh, you know, lived through exactly the same thing. Our life was pretty much lived on the street. Uh, Dad was from Swan Hill and mum was from Port Melbourne and they were they were distantly related by marriage, uh, which is how they got to meet. Um, one of her aunties was married to one of his uncles and, uh, and that, that's how they got to meet each other. He came and, and stayed at their place when he came down to enlist and, uh, and that was the first time he'd ever seen the ocean um, or seen the sea. And at that, that stage, of course, it was the seaside at Port Melbourne. And uh, her father was uh, a stevedore that worked on Station Pier and Prince's Pier and, uh, you know, and a member of, I suppose, the Painters and Dockers in those days. Um, but anyway, they were, they were very poor people. They, they were very... Well, I, I suppose fairly average for their time, but uh, certainly didn't have any money. And from the the house that I was brought up in in Port Melbourne uh, was in Stoke Street, and uh, and from the front 
gate of that house, you could actually see Station Pier. So my grandfather spent his entire life living within sight of where he worked, um, which is great because you, you don't need a car. I, I've had to drive millions of miles to get to work as an actor. And uh, anyway, dad being from the country decided that he wanted to go back to the country and uh, they moved out of Port Melbourne to Croydon, which in those days, 1950 was in fact the country you know like it was it, it was there were orchards and things around the place but uh, mostly it was just the bush the, the countryside and uh i it, it sort of created a huge rod for his own back because he worked at uh anglis's abattoir at footscray and ended up traveling by train or driving in old bombs of cars all the way to Footscray from Croydon for the rest of his working life. Um, and I, in fact, went to work there. I, I went to work there in school holidays and things like that. And uh, eventually went there to work full time. Excuse me, I turned that off. Um, that was supposed to be on aeroplane mode. Sorry, it is. But anyway, um, sorry. So yeah, I worked there full time because you got um, adult wages, which I think was about twenty-one pounds in those days, which is fifty-two dollars. And uh, um, tried to save some money in order to go to NIDA. Oh. I'm sorry, that's uh... anyway. Um, yeah, so I, I worked there for quite a while and it was a, a, an amazing place to work. I, I was st still only in my early teens and uh, I, uh, it, it was a, a, an extraordinary place to work. You know, it was uh, a huge factory opposite virtually opposite um, Flemington Racecourse. And uh, it was slightly up the hill from the city abattoirs and on the other side of Maribyrnong River. But um, it, uh, it was a massive place that, you know, and it was a slaughterhouse. It was just, uh, um, but it was an amazing place to work. And the people that worked there were an extraordinary range of people, and, uh, and a lot of them were small-time crims uh, who followed the the lambing season up and down the east coast and uh, avoiding the police in various states as they went. But um, uh, you know, as I said, I worked there for about a year at the end, at, at, towards the end of that period, and. Uh, tried to save some money, but as usual, I was hopeless at saving money. I think I, I left for NIDA with about $40 um, in savings, which was useless. But uh, I'd, I'd spent my, most of my teens working for the Victorian Railways back in the days when the Victorian Railways actually provided a service. And uh, you know, and there were porters who helped you with your luggage and there were who took your tickets at the various stations and there were station masters and the, and the stations were taken care of and some of the station masters had great tubs of flowers growing on their platforms and they treated them, they treated their places like little fiefdoms, I suppose, and... Uh, and and actually looked after them. They they weren't derelict or run down or covered in graffiti. It was, uh, and as I said, the railways in those days provided the service. I worked at the dining car depot, which was um, just opposite Festival Hall um, in West Melbourne, at the at the other, at the far end of the Spencer Street railway yards. 
and we used to uh, service the interstate trains there. Well, I was a clerk, but um, and that, that was my proper job, which I talk about in a bit of detail in the book. But um, uh, I worked in a, a place that had a laundry where they did all the sheets and, uh, you know, out of the uh, sleepers for the interstate trains, the Spirit of Progress and the Southern Aurora and uh, the Overland to Adelaide and the, the Sun, the, the, what was it called? The Sunraysia, the, the, the train to Mildura, I can't remember now. But um, anyway, it was um, it was an amazing place with, you know, and of course most of the people who worked in the laundry were women and uh, and there were various other people, you know, there were people who serviced the, the cars themselves, the carriages who were more your traditional um, boiler makers and welders and things like that. And, uh, and uh, there was also a, a bakery and a butchery that, you know, the butchery provided various cuts of meat to go in, in the dining cars, but, uh, and the bakery made cakes and Victorian railway pies. So I, I developed a, a great lo love for Victorian railway pies. They were fantastic. But the, uh, the head butcher was a guy named Max, who was quite, you know, quite spivvy. He had uh, brill creamed hair and a little... No, I don't think he had a moustache. It was Bertie the baker who had a moustache and always had flour in it. He had sort of more sandy hair and uh, Max was black and, uh, you know, dark haired. And, uh, and they used to have monumental rows about the quality of the meat that uh, Max was providing for Bert's pies. <laughs> but the pies were delicious, I have to say, and uh, they were especially good because they were fresh out of the oven when we got them in the, in the clerical office that we worked in. And I, um, I also did the pays and things like that. So at the end of, you know, the, I, think, I think once a week the pays, maybe it was once a fortnight, I think it was once a week, um, the pays came round and we had to separate them into pay packets, separate all the money into pay packets. And along with the money came a, a revolver, a, an automatic revolver. And uh, well, so it was a automatic, it wasn't a revolver, it just, yeah. So, um, and that came in the calico bag with the money. And uh, at the end of the, the payday, I would have to carry this gun back to Spencer Street, uh, you know, the head office at Spencer Street, which is now a hotel, of course. Um, and, you know, I'd carry this gun through the railway yards and up onto the platform of Spencer Street and then along the platform, you know, <laughs> this calico bag with a, you know, a teenager in charge of it. I, I, you know, I was never given any lessons on how to use it or, you know, if anybody had attacked me and knocked me on the head, they would have been the proud owner of a, an automatic pistol. And uh, and we wouldn't have known how to use it, any of us in the, in the clerical office at the dining car depot, we wouldn't have had a clue. You know, <laughs> just, I presume you just pulled the trigger, but, you know, thank God nobody ever attacked us. But uh, anyway... Um, that was my life um, for most of my teens. And I had at school been, I'd become very interested in acting. I don't know why, but uh, I, uh, I became besotted with it. And uh, I, um, I, that's all I ever wanted to do. Once I'd, uh, once I'd done it, I, I never wanted to do anything else. And, uh, I guess the the smell of the grease paint, the roar of the crowd got me and uh, I was hooked forever. But, um, you know, I spent, you know, all my teens uh, longing to uh, become an actor, but nobody I knew, including the teachers who'd 
been uh, instrumental in my working as an actor or, you know, doing school plays, uh, none of them had the faintest idea how to become an actor either. And, uh, and the only actor any of us really had uh, ever heard of was Frank Thring. And, uh, of course, you know, um, Frank was notorious. Uh, he was, you know, in those days, notorious for his homosexuality and affectation and, uh, and uh, his hammy acting. Um, but I, you know, when I eventually grew up and came, uh, came to be an actor, I worked with Frank on several occasions and he was um, the most lovely guy. He was absolutely wonderful. I see that Paul is back on screen with me. Uh, am I supposed to be finishing now, or <laughs> I haven't even finished my childhood? That, oh, that's okay. I've just been um, just enjoying listening to the stories, John. It's 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 really been beautiful. Um, and I was having a little giggle about thinking, gee, those Victorian railway pies sound very appealing. They were great. <laughs> They were absolutely fantastic, and yeah. they used to sell them at the concourse at Flinders Street and at Spencer Street, of course, and uh, yeah. they used to transport them to all the stations in the like You could get them on all three stations. And, mm. um, beautiful. John, I was just, um, you, were, you were actually, it was beautiful. You were just doing that connection point into saying um, you, you just started to, to love acting, um, and I was just wondering, um, you know, what what was that um, what was that big break for you? You know, going from just a, an early actor starting off. When when did you really feel like you were moving into something that was just really kind of where you felt that this is wonderful moment for you? I don't know quite. I don't know quite where that began, but I um, I. Uh, when I was working for the railways, uh, the, the teacher that I'd known at school, John Ellis, uh, came back from the UK and he and his new wife, uh, Lois Ellis, uh, decided to start a theatre company for young people, you know, called Melbourne Youth Theatre. And, uh, and lots of people got their start in that little organisation. It was very... It was, you know, very small. Uh, John was the head of drama at Rusden and Lois worked at uh, the drama, in the drama department at Parkville at the University of Melbourne. And, uh, and uh, she worked with Max Gillies and uh, Ron Danielson and uh, a couple of other people. And, and it turned out, you know, we, we were part of this small theatre company. The first thing I did with them was uh, the Caucasian Chalk Circle by Bertolt Brecht. And uh, and that was uh, the first time I ever met or saw Anne Pendlebury, who, uh, who worked as my agent until fairly recently. Um, and uh, she's the brother of Andrew Pendlebury, who... Uh, the lead guitarist for the sports and uh, you know so we all sort of I don't know we all gravitated to this place and uh, and that's where I you know really decided that's all I wanted to be and one day Lois Ellis brought me a piece of paper and handed it to me and it was an entry form to get into NIDA and I didn't know but she had been at NIDA uh, herself, she'd been there in the, in one of the first couple of years, along with uh, Robin Nevin and Peter Couchman and people like that. And I, I had no idea, but she gave me this entry form, which I thought was absolutely useless to me because it required the leaving certificate, which I didn't have. But anyway, I sent the form in, and. Uh, and I got an audition, despite the fact that I didn't have my leaving. And uh, I went and did the audition at Russell Street Theatre in the, uh, in, I, I don't know, a lot of, a lot of the people are, are watching at the moment would remember Russell Street as a tiny little theatre behind what was once the Lyceum and is now 
I can't remember what it's called now, but uh, I should know. But it's, a, it's mainly a music venue or a comedy venue these days, or oh, a venue for the film festival. But it's um, on the corner of Russell Street, and the Russell Street Theatre was uh, a tiny little. I don't know what it had originally been, but uh, anyway, I did my audition there for uh, the head of head of NIDA, a guy named Tom Brown, who, and he was the only person in the, in the theatre, just him. These days they do multiple auditions with a lot of different people. I, I actually, I actually honestly believe that if I auditioned for NIDA now, I wouldn't get in. I, you know, like I, I just don't have the skills that, <laughs> Mm. that they require these days but back then I was uh, it's a different time isn't it yeah different time, totally different time and uh, you know like I'm I I'm absolutely hopeless at improvisation now and I was probably even worse at improvisation back then but these days they've got to do impros to get in you know and various they get put into various situations they have to uh, do you know to show their skills and uh, you know mm. and so many people these days you know young people have got you know uh, great singing voices and dance skills and movement skills and all sorts of other you know mm. they can juggle and <laughs> do all sorts of things and I all I can do is basically interpret a text so um, um, we have a um, we have a question from one of our audience men um, members, Julie. What has been your most favourite theatre or TV role? I think um, well, I think TV roles easy. That that would have been Rafferty's Rules, you know, because it was so uh, Rafferty was just such an interesting character. Um, and uh, the sort of character that had, we'd never seen on television in Australia up until then. And uh, I, I think, um, you know, he was genuine and, uh, and he was recognisable and uh, he had a great sense of humour and a, a great sense of fun and, and high moral standards that, uh, that nobody in government seems to have anymore. Um, I think it was, um, I mean, I think it was a great character to play and, uh, you know, the scripts were really terrific and interesting and sort of like real life situations. So that, that, that you know, that was the role I most loved on. In the theatre, I guess my favourite role would have to have, have to have been, um, well, there are two that I really loved, and they're both sort of clowning roles. Um, the, the first is Bottom in uh, A Midsummer Night's Dream. And, uh, uh, you know, it's just, it's just the most wonderful, wonderful writing. Shakespeare's, Shakespeare's comedy in Midsummer Night's Dream is just exquisite. And the other character, I think, that was was, uh, you know, a big hit for me was um, uh, Jock in The Club, David Williamson's play. And uh, that's a connection that I have to Bayside. Um, I, did, I did hundreds of performances as Jock for Hit Productions, which is based in Sandringham. Uh, Chrissy Harris ran the company from there, and it's still it's still going. And uh, yes, uh, Jock, you know, was just a again, a, as I said, a, another clowning role. I didn't realise that that um, that I was such a clown, but uh, you know, I guess I am. Um, they, were, they were my favourite roles, and the uh, the other uh, standout would have been. Um, another Shakespeare clown, which was uh, Sir Toby Belch in Twelfth Night, which I did with uh, the same company as Midsummer Night's Dream. Uh, the the um, Lighthouse Company, which was the State Theatre Company of South Australia, run by Jim Sharman and Neil Armfield, 
and uh, I did all the all my work in that play with Jeffrey Rush, and we had a great we had a great uh, I don't I don't know what the word is, but we worked very well together anyway, and uh, had a lot of fun doing that play too. But uh, unfortunately, <laughs> never played them all. But, uh, we did it in Sydney, but uh, and that's um, taking that play from South Australia to Sydney was the thing that got me back in, really back into the business of acting. I'd been working mainly as a writer prior to going to Adelaide, and uh, and when I did Twelfth Night in Sydney. Um, it reminded a lot of producers up there that I was still alive and active in the business. And uh, I started getting a lot of work in Sydney, uh, including the challenge where I played Alan Bond in the America's Cup uh, mini series and then yes. uh, Rafferty's Rules. So mm, Wonderful. John, we've got another um, question uh, from the audience. Uh, what works have you written for theatre or um, TV? Well, television, uh, I, 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 at one point I was working as a jobbing actor. Well, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm still working as a jobbing actor, except there are no jobs. Um, I, uh, I was doing shows, you know, as, you know, small guest roles on... Uh, Shows like um, Homicide and uh, and in this particular point in time, uh, Cop Shop, and uh, it was um, you know like I I found it very distressing in a way as an actor because that's not why I wanted to be an actor playing a small time crim being bashed up by John Orchick and then arrested and thrown into jail. It wasn't. Uh, it wasn't where I saw my career. I mean, I, I always saw acting as being a, like like all the other art forms, uh, theatre as as being a, a a way to comment on the society in which you lived, and uh, which I guess is one of the reasons that the federal government hasn't looked after the theatre very well during the pandemic because we're often critical of um, governments and they uh, they don't like being criticised. So they've been, you know, actors weren't able to get job seeker or job keeper or anything. So we've been just totally left out in the cold during this uh, pandemic. Um, but I always believed that acting was about commenting on your society, you know, and helping people or, you know, pushing people towards changing their views on certain things. If you've got, uh, you know, like a, a lot of theatre has been created to change people's views or their views of what the world should be like or reinforce their views of what the world is or should be. And... Uh, Doing it as a small-time crim on cop shop wasn't wasn't the way of getting that message across. I don't think so. I sort of gave away acting and started writing for cop shop and uh, and then for prisoner and uh, the Sullivans and various you know various other things over the years. The only works I have written for the theatre a bit, but the only shows that have ever been produced was a play called On Your Marks, which was done at the original Nimrod in Sydney. Um, and uh, it was done at the Pram Factory in Melbourne. Um, I wrote it for Max Gillies, who, you know, was by then a, a, an old mate and uh, is, uh, you know, I still, you know, work with Max and... Uh, I'm looking forward to doing a show with him in the in the coming year. We were we were supposed to do a a, a second season or a return season of Senior Moments, which we'd done uh, oh, yes. about eighteen months ago, and 
but uh, getting you know, out of the pandemic and into the theatre is quite difficult. So the, the people that wrote Senior Moments have written a, a three-hander called Mono, which is just for three actors, and uh, Max and I and Jean Kitson, hopefully, uh, are just doing a series of very funny monologues. And, uh, uh, yeah, yeah, so that's hopefully coming up in the coming year. But, um, God, I'm You're Wonderful, John, to look out for that. That's fantastic. Um, so I'm just conscious of our time together. Now, I'm just going to let our audience members know because I need, I need our audience members to be pretty quick off the mark. We've got some questions coming up to, to give away um, your new uh, memoirs. Um, but just, just before um, we jump to that, we do have... Um, now, there was a question around uh, your connection to the, the Cerberus in Bayside. You got a oh, yeah. I... Uh... I was the patron of the uh, Save the Cerberus uh, Association for uh, quite a while. And I still get, I still get the newsletters, but I did. Um, I, I, you know, I think the Cerberus is uh, an amazing piece of Australian history that should be preserved, and uh, you know, and getting anybody to do anything, getting the federal government or any the state government to, to get on board and salvage it is um, well nigh impossible. You know, the thing that, that appalls me is that it's, it's the last battleship of its class. You know, it's the only one left. You know, they, they were, there weren't all that many of them built monitor class battleships, but... Um, they were very much a 19th century battleship, uh, armour clad, uh, basically, and basically they, they often still sailed them rather than have, having them driven by steam. But the, the Cerberus is, is unique in that, that there is no, no other ship of its kind anywhere in the world. We've got the only one, and it's sitting there in Black Rock and Half Moon Bay, and uh, and rusting away. And it should be protected and turned into a museum, in my view. But um, I, I did a documentary called "As Australian As," you know, and for the same people that uh, doing that wonderful show that's on the ABC at the moment called. Um, remastering Australia. Uh, I think that's what it's called, but it's uh, um, Aaron Pedersen, whom I worked with in the club, in the first production we did of the, of the club, um, uh, is narrating it. And it's just, you know, like it's, it's a wonderful series of, oh, it's a wonderful collection of footage that's never been shown, you know, it was, okay. um, they've been collected over the years and has been just stored away in cans or on video somewhere and it's finally being shown and it's, it's wonderful. But I did a show for the same group of people, um, Bear Cage Productions called As Australian As and it was just a, a show about my you know, my interest in various things and uh, a couple of them being old cars, which are in fact English, but then, you know, that's, <laughs> they were Australian because they were mine. Um, but uh, I, I went to, you know, d during the course of this, uh, I went to a place in New England called Bingara, a small town, on the, uh, oh, yeah, I can't remember the name of the highway now. It's it's like the Diamond Highway or something, the Gemstone Highway or something like that. You know, people went collecting sapphires and various other uh, jewel jewelry gemstones, and uh, and they had this beautiful theatre, which I also did the club in, uh, was the first time I saw it, uh, called the Roxy, 
And the Roxy was this beautiful theatre that was built in 1927 by a, a couple of Greek guys who built this picture palace and it was the Roxy. And, you know, in this small town that, you know, like inhabited by about 10 people. <laughs> and it was, it was just the most gorgeous place. And uh, it had been renovated in the in the few years prior to our going there with the club and uh, and that would you know so the two things that I'm mainly featured in in that documentary my point of view of Australia were the Roxy and the Cerberus and uh, the Cerberus of course was built in the UK at the Yarrow shipyards and uh, was sailed out to Australia. God knows how it got here because it's, you know, virtually a flat bottomed platform with, you know, covered in steel. And, uh, and it's, it's very, it was very good for sailing around Port Phillip Bay, but I, I would have hated to have been on it out in a, a big yeah. sea. But yeah. uh, anyway, but this was, you know, like I, I, I as I said, uh, I believe needs to be preserved and uh, and I would I would wish it could be turned into a, a museum of some sort that people could actually get out onto and uh, explore. Mm, be amazing. Go diving. All right, John, we're going to jump in just so we don't run out of time here. Now, I'm going to ask a particular question and what we need audience members is uh, to jump on in there. And, um, and if you get that correct, of course, we'll be able to send you one of John's new books out to you. So the first question is, what year did John win the gold Logie? So we'll just give people a little bit of time to think about that one and see whether they can come up with. So that's the first question. So what year did John win his win the gold the gold Logie? <clears throat> Can you remember that night, John? I do, and look, I I actually got it out of the bookshelf so that uh, people could because uh, normally I have to pick up the computer and <laughs> show it around the room. But this this very well travelled Logie, I, I did a series of advertisements for. Uh, retirement villages called Living Choice, uh, which were mainly in Queensland. And every time I went to the village, I had to take this with me because people wanted to hold it and have a look. And, you know, so I thought, you know, for the people out there that are watching today, or joined yeah. us today, this is, this is the closest you'll get to it, I'm afraid, because it doesn't <laughs> travel that way. All right. Well, we do have a we do have a winner. Um, wonderful, Karen. So we'll get your details and send you out the book. Let's jump on to the next question. What was John's character's name in Blue Healers? And I may have given that away a little bit earlier. May you? <laughs> <laughs> okay, we have a winner there. Lovely win. Um, and our third question is, what was John's character na character's name in Power Without Glory? That was, uh, that was a very long time ago. So if you remember that, you are a senior. Uh, <laughs> well, let's have was... a look with it. So, yes, so that was, what was John's character name in Power Without Glory? We certainly have a member who has watched that and they've said, hey, what a great show. Yes, that was a bit, a, a bit of a groundbreaking uh, show on Australian TV as well. It was the first big historical drama that we shot in colour in Australia and uh, uh, it was huge. We, we, we worked on it for... Uh, 13 months shot 26 episodes wow. in 13 yeah. months and uh, my character aged from uh, 18 to 72 
not quite as old as I am now, but. Uh... All right. Well, we do have someone that has said John Wren. No. No. <laughs> that was an actor named Martin Vaughan played oh. John Wren. Yes. No. Yes. All right, so we, we do have some winners, John, which is fabulous. So we will get the details and get that new book out to them, which is wonderful. Um, look, we will need to um, finish up. Um, John, did you want to say just any final words before we finish uh, today? Well, I, I'm sorry that I waffled on so much in, in talking to you all, but thanks for tuning in and uh, thank you for, uh, you know, because it's people like you who watch those shows in such huge numbers that uh, got me that gold logie and uh, and have kept me employed and employable for a, you know what has been a you know a, an amazing fifty years of uh, working in a, a very shaky industry. Um, so thanks for all those years of tuning in. Yeah, and it's I, lovely. I hope you've had a good time this morning. Oh, and I, and, um, I, and um, we'd like to thank you on behalf of Bayside and people in the audience today. You've been incredibly generous with your stories, John. It's, um, and I love just so many little gems in there about what it was like growing up and your different experiences and how you got into acting. And look, we could talk for ages and ages. So um, thank you so much for being part of the Seniors Festival this year, well, and um, and we we wish you so we wish you well. Well, thank you. I hope the, the bookshops will be open again soon, and you'll be able to buy copies of the book. It's, uh, <laughs> and we have a lovely I, comment. Always look right. forward to watching your performances, John. Keep going. So there's some lovely thank comments you, coming through. Yes. Yeah. Thank you very much. Yeah, lovely. So on, um, we'd like to thank you, John, and um, thank you everybody for joining us this morning for the one of the senior festival activities. Um, there are still some activities coming up um, throughout this week. So please hop onto our website and find out what else is available for you to join. So thank you and have a lovely afternoon.